Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Professor David Tizard and welcome to this lecture on multiculturalism in Korea. This is a very important topic and it can be looked at from a, a number of different ways. I guess personally, I'm part of a multicultural family as a British citizen. Uh, I have permanent residence here in South Korea. I'm married to a South Korean. We have two children, Edward and Elizabeth, and they have two passports. They have British and Korean passports. We are a multicultural family, so according to South Korean laws, so when we apply for their uh, kindergarten positions and things like that, we get extra points. Um, not a lot, but there are different weights that we get with these things, and there are other benefits. So. Uh, I come from this from a family perspective, I guess. Um, that's how that works. But there will be hundreds of different perspectives on this issue. And it's important because what we're seeing now is in other countries around the world, in certain areas, we're seeing a rise of nationalism. We're seeing a move away from the neoliberal order, which was focused on economics, globalization, diversity. That was the big story. That was the thing that was sold to the world. That's what we should follow. And there are good things and bad things to every policy. What happened with a lot of the uh, neoliberal program is that it didn't, uh, it focused perhaps so much on diversity that it forgot to recognize other people in society. And as a result, we've seen rising nationalism the opposite of multiculturalism perhaps is considered these days nationalism do you want a multicultural society where people of all different countries can live together or do you want a nationalist society where it's just us against them it's, it, this is our country and that go we've seen elements of like that perhaps with the uh rise of President Trump in America with this make America great again. Again, this is, it's a political message. That's fine. But that's very much a focus on, you know, our stuff. We're not worried about the world. You've seen America pull out of the WHO, the Paris uh, climate agreements and such forth. It's not so much now concerned with multiculturalism and diversity and globalization. It's more focused on itself. And Similar things in the United Kingdom uh, following Brexit. There was very much desire to get away from the European Union, which was a multicultural transnational governing body. It was above the nation. Uh, the, the European Union in Brussels was meant to be above the nation state and provide a multicultural diverse platform that would manage Europe. Again, the European Union is a very divisive and controversial issue. Um, lots of people support the European Union, say, from the outside. But if you suggest, well, would you like a, an Asian Union with Japan, China and South Korea? It becomes a bit different. It's like, no, 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 no. We want that one, but not our one. So it becomes a little bit different. Nevertheless, you see nationalism as an opposite of multiculturalism there and in other parts of Europe as well certainly Hungary, Poland, then you get nationalist movements in with the Basque people, the Catalan, the Scottish independence. That's coming to the fore. Now, in South Korea, how does nationalism and multiculturalism work? This has been something that's debated for a long time. Multiculturalism is not really part of South Korea's, well, it wasn't for a long time. Consider that some countries were built, the ground level, the foundations were multicultural. If you look at Canada, it, it's created or from, I, I might get some of these details wrong, but I believe the broader point stand that Canada has English and French as official languages. It, ha, it accepts and understands from its very outset that different people from different cultures were meant to live together. It was multicultural. I, similar with the United States, of course, it's having its own very serious racial social ethnic problems at the moment they haven't gone away it hasn't dealt with these things 
but it was from the outset with that sort of rebellion against the English but the people there it was meant to be for the people by the people of the people a, a mixed lot at least theoretically in, in principle it might have just been for the white men but then perhaps different white men with the Dutch the Spanish the French I'm not suggesting this was good to exclude others but nevertheless there was an element of multiculturalism to it South Korea is not multicultural and again this is not to say it's good or bad south korea is not multicultural it wasn't built that way it was built on a single culture it was built on the culture well it kind of changed i guess because we have a stop from the from the choson dynasty from uh, 1392 to let's say 1897 or 1905 or 1910 whichever date that you prefer probably 19 10 is probably the easiest. 1392 It was kind of one culture. There was one monarchy. There was one ruling family. And of course they were under the Chinese. Inside you might have had different cultures because you had still elements of Buddhism, of Taoism, of shamanism. You had all of these and there was a kind of harmony to it. From 1910 to 1945, that's a little bit different. Is there, you know, the Japanese were not very intent on multiculturalism. To this day, they're still not really intent on multiculturalism. Does multiculturalism affect different parts of the world differently? Are more, is it harder to have multiculturalism in Northeast Asia? I've gone a little bit off track, but let me continue it for a minute. For example, look at South Korea, Japan, uh, China, and North Korea. None of these countries really seem to embrace or want multiculturalism. But maybe that's that, that's absolutely fine. Each country should have its own uh, way of looking at things. And we shouldn't automatically assume that 100% multiculturalism is the way forward maybe it's not maybe it causes problems like we're looking at europe and we're seeing all these problems is multiculturalism a problem there i'm not saying we should separate races but in terms of government policies or things like that we need to question things it's always important to uh, look at these things moreover we need to think of it kind of like on a spectrum it's not just we want 100 percent multiculturalism or we want no multiculturalism and we want nationalism there's always a fine line. It's about the nuance and it's about the, the details in these kind of things. Now, South Korea was able to raise up after the colonization by the Japanese. A lot of that in part because of this idea of Uriminjo, our country, our race, our story. And of course, it was supported by the American government from 1948 onwards. Um, the American government ruled from 45 to 48, but then, you know, give the country to the South Koreans. Um, financial and military support to South Korea, but it was it, it's South Korea's independence from 1948 as an independent individual nation. And the way it's been able to survive and do so well to go from a country that was mired in poverty. You look at the photos from around that time, you know, people living in dirt, in hearts, and uh, using human feces for fertilizer and, and, and these kind of things to what it is now in Seoul. It's an amazing transformation. And some of that has been achieved by this element that we are a family. This is Uri Nara, our country, Uri Minjok, our family, Uri Heng, Uri De Tongyong, all of these words to give a sense of um, responsibility to people that everybody is part of this nation, everybody is part of this family. And of course, that's very good, but it causes problems with when you get the other, with the people that are not inside the family. We've seen elements of this recently with the COVID-19, how Korea and Korea's response to the COVID-19 pandemic has not been perfect, but it's been very good in general. And a large part of that comes down to A, the government decisions, and also B, the people. Now, not everybody's acted responsibly. Some people have gone on Jeju holidays and Doljanchis and uh, parties in Cheongdamdong with a llama. With a llama. No, it wasn't a llama. It was an uh, alpaca. Uh, 
Um, so of course those things happen, but in general it's been quite good. And you wonder how much of that is because of nationalism rather than multiculturalism. Could that have some good effects there? Um, if there are 10 married couples in South Korea, one couple would be a multicultural couple. That number is only going to increase, I think. So if there are 10 people, you'll find that. Uh, it's going to become more the norm. South Korea presents some of it on television, on media now. Uh, you're seeing more uh, famous couples being on television. And YouTube and Netflix, all those those things help, like whether it's Yonggook Dave or English Josh or all these people, I forget their names sometimes, but with no disrespect, they help. But one in 10, and that number is only going to go up, especially because, well, because there's more international marriage, but because there are fewer and fewer Korean marriages and weddings, that number is dropping uh, quite a lot. Um, this is really important in terms of multiculturalism in South Korea. So the total marriage is in 2016. We're four years behind. Um, it's, it's not great, but it's not bad. Um, international marriages by wife's nationality. The largest percentage, 27.9, and the second largest percentage is 26.9, Vietnamese and Chinese. And this is the wife's nationality here. And then Philippines, Japan, Thailand, the US. So you can see that the majority of multiculturalism in South Korea is not this kind of model that you get on the television programs where it's, say, a white guy like me and a Korean woman. That's a very, that's, a, that's an image that you get quite a lot. Not sure why, maybe because of the media, uh, you get webtoons based on it. But the vast majority of these international marriages, even still to this day, are between Korean men and then Asian women, Vietnamese women or Chinese women. There's a huge percentage there. Over half are with Vietnamese wives or Chinese wives. And looking at this, the nationality of foreign residents in South Korea. So what? who are the foreigners? Who are the... the who are the foreign residents in South Korea. This is 2014, again, a little bit old, but for the most part, a lot of these stati statistics still kind of hold. Um, Chinese, including ethnic Koreans, over half. And then Vietnamese, over 10%, South Asians, Americans, Filipinos, and other. What you notice, again, is such a huge percentage, sort of 75% of the foreign residents in South Korea are Asian. Uh, from different parts of this and th they don't look like me um, I'm very much a minority you see Americans are 4.5% uh, percent of residents the British are much lower than that I would suggest probably about 1 or 2% if that of the foreign residents in South Korea very much an anomaly however compared to a lot of the other foreigners, I'm far more visible. I get far more opportunities to be on radio, on television, in the newspapers, uh, working with different things. Why is that? Why is there more representation of this image of multiculturalism when statistically uh, it's far lower? So I am kind of privileged or lucky in that aspect that I get to work, but we shouldn't forget that multiculturalism for the most part when we say multiculturalism what we really should mean is not necessarily my family although we shouldn't discount it it's still real and I know thousands of other people like me in this situation but there's a far far greater number in South Korea uh, that are different and the multiculturalism is between Korea and other parts of Asia especially Southeast Asia or Northeast Asia. That's a really important thing to make sure that we understand. The composition of age gap between husband and wife. So when Koreans marry, if a Korean marries a Korean, what you'll find here is that the, ma the majority of the marriages, um, over 50, 53%, 
the man is one to five years older. So the man is just a little bit older. And I've heard that in South Korea, a four year gap is deemed good. And especially if you look at the Ds, like the Yong Di, Rang Yi Di, uh, what's he? K Di, Dung Dung Dung, Yong Di, and Dak Di. Um, if you look at the Ds, that's how they line them up as well. It's where this, perhaps where this four year age gap comes from. Also, they say women mature more quickly than men. So if the woman, if the man is four years older, they might be about the same level of maturity. Um, it does also reinforce that kind of, what would you call it, gap or, or that position with honorifics and language as well, however. 16% um, are the same age. 17% are elder women. Uh, men 10 years older, men age. So in general, the vast, the more than half are men one to five years older. The second most popular type of marriage in South Korea is that the woman, oh, <laughs> don't click David, is that the woman is older than the man. That's quite an interesting statistic, I think. If we look at multicultural marriage and remember that multicultural marriage, now we understand the great majority of it, it's Korean men with uh, women from other parts of the world, Asia. Men aged 10 years and over is 51%. Men aged 10 years and older between Koreans is only 3%. So there's a great difference between these two things. Um, the second is men aged 1 to 5, then 6 to 9, the same age, or an elder woman. So the top three here are that men are older than the wife, uh, especially for the, far, the, the vast majority, it's more than 10 years. And of course, in South Korea, with the... You know, we've looked at Gert Hofstede's power distances and things like that in his cultural dimensions. A 10 year age gap creates quite a big power distance. You know, that's that's quite a big thing to cross over. It's for Korean people. Sometimes, I guess it's hard to be friends with somebody 10 years older than you. A lot of my friends, are, you know, people in my band, they're in like 52. They don't look 52, but they're old. They're a lot older than me, 12, 13 years older than me. But we're absolutely friends. There's no problem with it. In South Korea, 10 years is quite a big age gap. You know, can you can you be a chingu with someone who's your 10년 언니? Sabasa It differs from person to person. Um, but that's a very big age gap between people. And that, I think, uh, is important to pay attention to in terms of multicultural marriage they're the vast majority and uh you might have seen that i'm doing work with the bombable the ministry of justice and a lot of that uh, I, I was very pleased to see that um a, a lot of the representation there are from these areas it's not just yeah there is there is what do you call it fabian and julian and, and these people um and myself but that's the minority. They might be the most visible, or certainly a couple of them, they might be the loudest, but uh, these areas are really well represented in that program. So when I was looking, uh, when I was taking part in that, uh, that was really pleasing to see. One of the things that we're doing in that Bombubu program uh, with Chumie is we suggested to her, uh, this was suggested by the other people, I don't have my wallet here, uh, on my card on my id card it says alien registration card right alien registration card that's what it says and so uh, these people have asked that they don't want to be called alien anymore because you think of alien you think of you know et or little green men or shoot the aliens aliens don't sound good aliens don't sound friendly so one of the things that we've been doing in that program or one of the first things that happened in that program was asked to be called um foreign nationals or yeah i think foreign resident foreign that foreign resident card rather than being called an alien like a weguk so language around this subject is slowly changing and you wonder whether because if you change the language and no we'll, st we'll still be weguks if I walk with my child sometimes, people, just little kids, will go, Oh, we go gita! They say, Oh, me go saramanda! I'm not me go saramanda! I don't say that by the way, nice. But I wonder if the, the language changes, it won't change people's uh, perceptions overnight. 
but I wonder slowly if that might do something with it. Um, with the Harfi project, which I've briefly probably shown to you before, I think the Harfi project is very interesting because it shows you, and again, Harfi can be a, a kind of a, a challenging word for some people. I've, I've written about this in the press using the word Harfi. And I got some emails saying, David, I'm glad you said that. And other emails saying, David, you're not allowed to use the word Harfi. So it's a thing, but it's not my word. Again, it's, it's Becky White's word. The interesting thing about this uh, multicultural project is that what Becky does is she finds all the different multicultural Koreans. It's not just all, you know, things like my kids, Edward and Elizabeth, that you, you would expect, but from all over the world. Let's just have a, a quick look if this will work. A, a, a two minute introduction. Hi everybody and welcome to the half. Uh, let me try again after phones that I was using earlier and sound might work. Hi Becky, can you start again please? Hi everybody and welcome to The Happy Project. My name is Becky and I am the creator of The Happy Project. Well, what is The Happy Project? So, it's something that I've actually been dreaming about for a good number of years and it was born out of this question of identity. It's kind of part art, part research, asking the question, what does it look like to be half Korean? What does that mean? What are those experiences? And I was hoping to kind of create this community for people who belong to both worlds and at the same time don't belong to anywhere at all. And so my father is from the United States, my mom is from Korea, and I am obviously half Korean, and I'm living here in Seoul right now. And since moving to Korea about six years ago, my experiences and questions and the way I look at myself drastically have been challenged, and I've had to kind of look more into that. And, and I was discovering new things about being half Korean, things that I probably wouldn't have asked if I was just living in the US. However, being here in Korea and meeting more half Koreans, I started to recognize that I wasn't the only one asking these questions. I wasn't the only one feeling this way. And I realized that there really wasn't a platform or a space where we could just talk about these things, about race and culture and mixed backgrounds and ethnicities and what does it mean, where do we belong and who are we? And so for the Happy Project, through videos, interviews, we've got the YouTube channel as you can see, and we also have the podcast, the website, the Instagram, we're sharing stories, we're creating a place where we can talk about these issues and just be ourselves as half Koreans, as halfies, and we're hoping to branch out to all other nations as well. So if you're not half Korean, but you are half one culture and another, you are more than welcome here. And I guarantee you're probably going to relate to a couple things. So if you have your own stories that you want to share, you can always leave comments, you can send us messages, and email us at thehappyproject at gmail.com. Make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel, hit the notification bell so you can get updates right away, and stay tuned for our podcast, where we have these stories and more long form content where you can really get to know our guests and who we are and what the Happy Project is about. So we really hope to hear from you. Thanks for watching. We are the Happy Project. Thank you, Becky. Stop. Okay, so this is a modern the, the reason I think this is interesting because it's not government funded and there's nothing wrong with governments governments do a lot of good things they they help us they they build hospitals and they build roads give us police and they do a lot of great things but a lot of the time government policies because they're run from bureaucracy bureaucracy the rule of paper um they're not always the most successful now consider um the government the south korean government has spent millions of dollars on, I, I, perhaps even billions of dollars, I think, millions of dollars on trying to increase the South Korean birth rate. They've, they've spent many, but they haven't been able to do it. They've had all of these ideas, they've had all of these projects, they've spent all of this money on it, and it hasn't solved anything. The, the birth rate has continued to decrease. That's a whole nother conversation, and 
there might be good things about that because it means more women are being educated they're following careers they're they're living for themselves that's a whole other conversation and it's not necessarily to paint it as a as uh, an individual problem my point is that the government has spent a lot of money on it and it just hasn't worked the government is not omnipotent the government is not this superpower that can come up with rules that solve problems sometimes the government's rules can can suck sometimes quite frankly um that's not to say they intend to do that but they just don't kind of get it a lot of the time governments are people that live differently from you and i um and they, they as much as they might try to understand real lives they're always a little bit removed and, and they make decisions based on political expediency or what will look good rather than actually what will be effective this Harfi project sorry for ragging on the government for a little <laughs> wasn't my point but with this Harfi project it's it's not a government initiative it's not a government project and that's what i think is interesting because this is just one there are other things like this Harfi project is the one i know because um i know becky i worked with her a little bit on the radio but and it has a huge following i look at some of the numbers on the videos and the podcast it's it's really good and she's doing a great job of getting this out there and that's how it's happening it's happening organically it's happening bottom up from people rather than top down and I think these stories are really interesting. You might look also at um, Itaewon class. You get uh, characters in that. Um, also, the model whose name escapes me um, with no disrespect. I believe his uh, father might have been Nigerian. Um, but he's Korean. He speaks Korean. He doesn't speak English. And, and that's, that's these new things that are coming out not coming out from government not coming out from the top but coming out organically coming out in people's lives coming out in media and this is probably a really interesting way to look at multiculturalism my kids go to kindergarten they go to the youtube one and what really kind of shocked me the first time is when i see they will have these little uh cupboards to put their shoes in they go in and they take the shoes off and they put their shoes in they run off to the classroom and my son edward he he takes a little time to go he checks he's like okay i'll see you at four o'clock and my daughter started kindergarten elizabeth she started kindergarten for the first time uh, three days ago on wednesday her first day and you know all this covid19 she has to wear a mask she's young like you're gonna be all right she put her shoes in just ran she never looked back when i see my point of this story was when you see the little cupboards where they put their shoes in this is when i first realized multiculturalism because it said uh uh let's say kim kim ju hi pak song won nam chan il uh gu gu song song yi dong hyan kim ed the wood and the name was just this long you know all the other names fit on this little box then it got to his name is edward tizard but here is like kim edward he had one name but they call him kim edward his name is edward tizard edward david tizard actually it says that it says edward david tizard so it's even longer his name is huge edward david tizard that's a lot of characters considering most people have three and there's that first example of multiculturalism and those kids are going to grow up with edward and elizabeth who has the same you know elizabeth desired long name they're going to grow up with that and it's going to be normal for them i think that's becoming more part of the norm and, and again that's not a government initiative that's not putting people on television to say hey aren't foreigners interesting it's not like that it's just people growing up becoming acclimatized to it you might experience it more in your school at Sol Yode. the covid 19 is going to mean that there are less international students you have less chance to be around these people but see what goes forward before we 
Uh, let's have a look at this. This has been a very big story. So I want to have a look at uh, this story this week based on multiculturalism. So, hope this works. Uh, this is from the BBC correspondent in Seoul. Um, this is a decision by the Bomabu. This is Laura Bicker on May 29th, which is just a few days ago. And the Ministry of Justice, the Bomabu, they, they released a new policy for any foreigners living and working in South Korea. So I'm a foreigner, I live and work here, and we all have different visas. So you can have a visa if you're a gyosu, you can have a visa if you're married, you can have a visa if you're just a hagon teacher, if you're a celebrity, if you're a diplomat. All these, according to your job, you have different visas. Um, what has been said is that all foreigners, before they leave the country, we have to get permission. So before, if I go on holiday, or if I go back to England to see my relatives or something like that, we now have to go to uh, the immigration. We used to have to say, I I'm going, okay? And they have to say, okay. So we have to get permission to leave. We can't just buy a plane ticket anymore and go. We have to ask and get permission to leave the country. And before we come back, we have to have a health check before we come back in. So we have to do that. And if, if we don't do those two things, uh, we can have our whole visa canceled. So even if I live and work here, have family here, if I don't do those two things, my whole visa will be cancelled. Lots of countries make lots of different rules. During my time here, I've done health checks, drugs checks, AIDS checks, all sorts of things since I've been here. Um, and I understand that that's their Korean laws, so I, I protect laws. And uh, obviously with COVID-19, it's a difficult situation and they're trying to protect that. But the interesting thing was this. This applied to all foreigners except, except Gyopos. Except people that were um, mixed Korean. So if you're a Gyopo, which I mean is like an American Korean or an English Korean. Um, if you have mixed Korean descent, like the halfies we saw in Becky White's project. Um, you have a, a different visa. I believe it's an F. Four. The information's probably in this tweet somehow. Um, but those people were all exempt. And that's interesting because the the law was obviously made on the fact that if you're uh, not a Korean, you have to do that. But if you're a bit Korean, that's OK. And consider that, for example, somebody could have been here for 15 years like me, live, work, pay taxes, have Korean children, speak Korean a little bit and do these things uh, and the the Gyopo could have been here for two months not speak Korean not know anything just come over here and their laws would be different from mine and I'm, I'm not complaining but the only difference would be would be that one of their parents was Korean so laws are still being made in 2020 based on are you part of the Minjok are you part of this and to try to protect the country that's fine but uh, it was a big uh, kick in the teeth. Where we go, kin man, oh, that's hang on, raw, and they are. Why is it only aimed at foreigners? Do you believe this measure could be perceived as racist? There was there was a lot of talk about this, and um, I wasn't online, sort of shouting and getting angry. That's not generally what I do. Uh, my point in talking to you about this uh, particular issue is that in 2020, uh, governments and, and, and things like the Bob Mubu, who I'm meant to be kind of working with at the moment, they still make decisions that uh, seem to be influenced by Minjok or Han Minjok. Not saying that that's a bad thing, I'm saying that it's still a thing. And that's something worth considering, I think, when you discuss multiculturalism. Um, just going through a couple of things, you, you, you'll find lots, but um, 2019, December 17th, so six months ago in the Korea Herald, multiculturalism is inevitable in Korea's future. Over two million residents now live in Korea. This is more than double the figure in 2007. 
Kim Dong-yeon, president of the Korea Immigration Service Foundation, multiculturalism is inevitable. We have run integration programs for nearly 10 years with the goal of helping immigrants prepare for their lives here. The program includes introduction to language and cultural characteristics as well as immigrant rights. Allowing immigrants to make a smooth transition to their new homes is beneficial not only to the immigrants as individuals but to society as a whole. Most immigrants are here through marriage or an employment permit. They are often at a disadvantage and unfortunately subject to discrimination. If we fail them as a society in helping them settle in Korea or assimilate, should they want to, into our culture, that is one more person isolated from being able to function as a member of our community. Some seven and a half million Koreans live overseas. That's a huge number. That is three times the number of immigrants living here, he said, pointing out that migration was a natural occurrence. We have to stop thinking of immigrants in the third person because we may well be in their shoes someday. Politicians refrain from talking about immigrants because the subject is not exactly a vote winner. How do you feel about this, that politicians don't really talk about immigrants or what we can do because it's not going to win them votes now if you think that on the left in america or in europe if you're left wing which is like jimbo dan um these will really play up the immigrant multicultural thing so in the west western culture the right wing will be the nationalists the right wing will be the, the bosu dangs will be the conservatives they will want to keep the local tradition they will want to keep the local culture and there, there are some good things in that and the uh the left wing the jimbo dang uh they will want to embrace multiculturalism embrace social and ethnic minorities they want to give votes to these people and help bring them into society and open the borders and again there are some good things in that as well but the interesting thing is the point being made here is that in the west there is a voice for the immigrants it comes from the left and those two kind of balance each other out so hopefully you get something a little bit in the middle where it's not just open the doors and everyone can come into the country but it's not close them so nobody comes in but it's a nice balance because you have two opposing forces theoretically in south korea it's a little bit different though because first of all talking about it is not really politicians if they if they talk about sort of immigration we want you know we want more foreign labors we want to embrace this they're probably not going to be as successful in korean politics so they're not going to say it what works in korean politics is sort of going into this urinaro riminjok type thing if you look at president moon uh, and his government his administration they've done a fantastic job with COVID-19, whatever else you might want to say about economy or, or, or things like that. I, I think for the most part, compared to the West, President Moon has done a good job. His administration with um, was it Jong Un Gyeong and those people, and Kang Kang Wah. But there's a lot of nationalism in it. There's a lot of that, you're sort of, you know, no to Japan and uh, these rules coming out for the foreigners that we just did with Laura Bicker. If you analyze his speeches with North Korea, the minjok is a, is a really big thing in, in that. It's the word he uses most. Again, it's not to say it's good or bad, but that's what it is. And, and for Korean people, that might be exactly what it should be. It's not my position to criticize. But it doesn't give a voice for the immigrants then. There's no sort of side in it in the politics because, you know, the boss of Dang, they might be a bit more conservative and. Well, the conservatives were the first to have Jasmine Lee, you know, as a, as a nationalized Korean in the Gukwe. Um, but still, you know, quite conservative and then this side quite nationalist. So you don't get a, a political voice for the immigrants in there, which I, I think is that. It says our future is multi multicultural. No culture is independent from outside influences. Homogeneity is a myth. That's a very big thing to say. You know, the, the idea that we're one race, Han Min Jokun, Sinoa. Han Min Jokun, Sinoa. As for undocumented immigrants, Kim said there should be legal channels through which they could be allowed entry. 
For instance, there are vacancies in jobs unwanted by locals that these illegal immigrants are willing to fill. So you wonder, is he more worried about the Korean economy or is he more worried about, you know, multiculturalism or does it matter? Does it really play into that? So this is the head of the immigration office saying this. Um, I need to check whether uh, he still is Kim dong Um What I would say about this, when he says multiculturalism and the program includes introduction to language, cultural characteristics, as well as immigrant rights. Let me quickly... Should I find this or not? Am I going to... Uh, so, uh, this was a piece that I wrote today on the uh, topic of race. And let's just have a look at the first two two paragraphs here that I wrote. Sorry about my face being there. Um, so, Korea, race, racism, and the other from today. Korea's approach to multiculturalism is a paradox. The same multicultural policies and programs that have been enacted and encouraged by various administrations over the years have simultaneously reinforced racial and ethnic views vis-a-vis -vis nationality and citizenship. What I mean to say here is the projects that have um, tried to increase multiculturalism from the government, and, and they've been, you know, nice, noble, good attempts, these attempts to increase multiculturalism, at the same time, they reinforce that minjok. So they don't achieve the goal. They're promoted to do this, but what they do is they reinforce the opposite, and that's the paradox. It's just an opinion. Um, this is what I really wanted to say, this second paragraph. Multiculturalism often appears more akin to cultural assimilation. It means foreigners learning to eat kimchi, speaking Korean, wearing a hanbok, going on television programs, acting surprised at things. Oh, it's home like that. Or if you're like the vast majority of foreign nationals trying to acclimatize, it means learning how to be a good Korean wife and all the underlying Confucian conditions and requisites that come with it. So my suggestion here is, and again, it's just an observation, a suggestion that I'm willing to hear different opinions from, especially from Koreans, that multiculturalism isn't multiculturalism. It means if you come to Korea, you have to do our culture. You have to do what we do. So if you come to Korea, we want to help you learn and live here and do these things. It's right. You need to learn Gimchi. You need to learn these things. You need to learn the language. You need to learn our culture and you need to fit in. And if you can fit in and if you can learn and do these things, then you can be successful. If you can't learn and fit into these things, it's going to be hard for you. So how is that? multiculturalism it doesn't seem like multiculturalism it seems like hana culturalism or monoculturalism cultural assimilation you come here uh, and you please learn our way of thinking our ways of living and again i'm not saying that's a bad thing but i'm saying that it's not really multiculturalism it's not as if well you can speak French over there and you can speak English and we'll do this and we'll have some we'll have some buildings over there for you and that's what multiculturalism multiculturalism is, isn't it? It's when multiple cultures live together. If all the people from different countries come but they live in one culture, then it's not multiculturalism. And that's one of the points that uh trying to make with this. Uh, these are some of the statistics. Yeah, we already saw those. Let's have a look at this. So uh, I, I gave you this one to read, uh, Destructing Korea Multiculturalism. I, I read through it again, and there's some there's some good points in there. I feel overall some of the writing is, is just normal. Way. But there are some points that you, you might like to take from that. Um, just give me five minutes with this one, and then we'll uh, finish up. This is 2017, Timothy Lim. 
Is South Korea becoming a multicultural society, a society in which cultural differences and racial diversity are not merely grudgingly tolerated, but instead embraced by both the society and the state? This is kind of what we're talking about, not just, yeah, we'll let you speak English on television for a bit, or Chinese or Vietnamese, but is it being embraced? More formally, is there both official and societal recognition that ethnic and racial minority groups have both the right to become members of Korean society as citizens or permanent residents, I'm a permanent resident, and a right to maintain their specific ethno-cultural identities? The latter question underscores the core elements of multiculturalism, as some scholars have defined it, in the context of liberal democracy. By that definition, however, many observers have expressed deep skepticism about the fate of multiculturalism in South Korea. They argue that, despite a lot of talk about its importance, that liberal multiculturalism in South Korea is at best a facade, uh, an image, a fake. I don't know facade in Korean. I have to learn that. What's facade in Korean? Moreover, while there has ostensibly been movement toward multicultural policy, Skeptics argue that it is nothing more than a state-dominated effort to efficiently control and manage the reality of increasing ethnic and racial diversity. Some difficult language in here, but one of the points that we're looking at is in multiculturalism, in liberal democracy multiculturalism, you get to maintain your identity. So you don't have to assimilate, you don't have to adopt that culture. So, for example, if you were Hispanic going into America, you don't all of a sudden have to, I don't know, eat hot dogs and go hunting and watch baseball and go, hi, my name is John Smith. It's terrible. You're allowed to maintain your local or your original identity, your original ethnic identity. That's allowed. You're not forced into being something. Um, what people are saying is that in South Korea is not really embraced by the society or the state. That's not what's happening here. The skeptics have a point, but they are also short sighted. They are short sighted in large part because they fail to transition. They fail to recognize that the transition to a multicultural society is almost always a very long, gradual an intensely contested process. Very true. Even more, the skeptics fail to understand that in South Korea, the most crucial obstacle on the road to multiculturalism has already been surmounted, namely the one unquestioned belief that only those with pure Korean blood can belong to Korea. So the, the Minjok idea is gone now, according to Timothy Lim in this. That'd be interesting to do some research, see how many people believe in that and whether it differs by age or generation or, or political allegiance. For example, in North Korea, it's still pretty strong up there. They, you know, it, it's one Korean blood that they keep. You don't get marriages, dating with foreigners. Um, I know people who have lived in Pyongyang for 10, 15 years. That's a long time. As white foreigners. But they tell you, you can't, there's no chance. There's no chance of a relationship with a North Korean because it's about keeping that pure Korean blood. In the South, it might be different. Why has multiculturalism become an issue for South Korea in the first place? The answer boils down to two demographic trends. First, after decades of rapid industrialization, a dramatic rise in general living standards and a steady shrinking of the working age population due to declining birth rates. South Korea has had to increasingly rely on foreign immigrant labor in certain segments of the economy. Second, and perhaps more importantly, South Korean society has also had to rely on women from outside the country to help rectify a persistent imbalance in the gender ratio between marriage-ready South Korean men and women. In 2011, for example, for every 100 Korean women between the ages of 26 and 30, there were 111 Korean men of similar marriageable age. That's a big difference for every 100. So if you imagine that there were 10 or 20 million, that 111 difference really gets magnified. And again, that's with that sort of Confucian devotion to the boy carrying on the lineage or the, what do you call it, Jokbo. Uh, Socioeconomic changes have exacerbated this imbalance as many Korean women not only delay marriage, 
but also eschew marrying men from rural areas. Taken together, these two trends have resulted in a gradual but inexorable increase in racial and ethnic diversity within South Korean society. A quick look at some statistics bears this out. As late as 1995, the foreign resident population in South Korea was only about 0.24%. By 2016, it was 3.6. By all accounts, the figure will continue to grow. The Korean government projects that the number of foreign residents will exceed 3 million in 2030. Excuse me, or about 6.1% of South Koreans' population. That's very big. It's much bigger than what it was, say, in 1995. So multiculturalism takes a long time it says one of the first points if you need uh, quotes or anything for your research um, the transition to a multicultural society is always hard and difficult and long but these changes are coming quite quickly in terms of the numbers what's also interesting it's been a lot of it not a lot of it some of it is influenced by korean women not marrying or, or, or not marrying these things so when you get the uh, uh and you get this sort of give up and other elements that come in whether they're related to if this word offends you like hanam or you know the, the the gender kind of fight that is going on at the moment and the problems between the men and the women and the women now sort of following their own paths getting careers which is great being educated which is great that is kind of making the country more multicultural because it has to then bring in people from outside to marry these to marry the men and then to marry the women if they're going to if these people are going to get married and they're not going to marry each other they then marry people from outside so this is making the country more multicultural which is then really interesting because you think what if you want to be really kind of like proud 100% Korean but you also want to be had yeah now we're becoming more multicultural does that work could you be both would you want to be the heaviest concentration of new foreign residents is from China who make up about 50% of the total uh, the majority are ethnic Koreans known as Joseon Jok there are also a large number of immigrants from Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, Uzbekistan, Cambodia, Indonesia, Mongolia, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India. The vast majority of these new immigrants are unskilled foreign workers. The number of migrant marriage migrants, particularly women who come from Vietnam, China, Japan, and the Philippines, is relatively small, but far from insignificant. 2005, 42,000 multicultural marriages which was about 13% of marriages that year. Numbers have declined a little bit uh, between those 472,000 then. In addition to multicultural marriages are the children that come from these unisons. 2015, there were 20,000 out of 438. It's interesting that 50% of the, uh, the immigrants or the, the multicultural residents in South Korea are Chinese and it's with... It's that relationship that sort of more uh, that's going to be really interesting to sort out because what does South Korea do in terms of China economically, politically, culturally? Do you side with China? Do you not like China? Because the biggest percentage of the people here are Chinese and that's really important to to face and, and to look up with multiculturalism doesn't necessarily just mean accepting uh, people from france and and in canada the ones here are by far chinese that's real multiculturalism i guess faced with increasing racial and ethnic diversity the south korean government has pursued a two-pronged strategy for foreign immigrant workers, the government institutionalized the guest worker program in 2005 with basic labor rights, but which was also express designed, expressly designed to prevent long-term or permanent settlement. Now, you can come and work here, but you just come and work and you go home, please. For the most part, this program achieved that goal, but many foreign immigrant workers overstay their visas and live in Korea on a semi-permanent basis. A handful of these, moreover, marry Korean women, allowing them to settle. 
In 2016, there were at least 2,200 marriages between foreign men from developing countries and Korean women. The second prong focuses on migrant brides. For these immigrants, government policy has primarily based on assimilation rather than on recognition of their ethno-cultural identities. Thus, foreign women are not only expected to become conversant in the Korean language, but also in Korean customs and traditions. They are expected, simply put, to become good Korean wives. So this is not really multiculturalism, according to the article. This is a fairly recent phenomenon, especially compared to the West. Importantly, the West is generally used as the standard, if only tacitly, by which to evaluate progress towards multiculturalism everywhere. It is according to this standard that multiculturalism in South Korea appears weak to non-existent. Yet, Western societies have struggled mightily with the idea and practice of multiculturalism, despite, in many cases, a vastly longer experience with immigration and with racial and ethnic diversity. Keep in mind on this point that it was not until the mid-1960s that the United States and Canada finally did away with their overtly discriminatory, if not blatantly racist, immigration policies and turned toward an embrace of multiculturalism. In addition, it is important to note that multiculturalism has, more recently, come under attack throughout the West, which tells us that progress towards multiculturalism is often contested. This is really important. Hundreds of years and, and still maybe not working in the West on a big societal level. And it only recently that laws were changed like this. So to expect South Korea, you shouldn't compare 2020 South Korea, 2020 Canada. It's not really a fair test sometimes. People say to me, David, we need to allow this in South Korea. It's 2020. But South Korea hasn't been a liberal democracy for a long time compared to Canada or America or the United Kingdom. They've had different lengths of time. And who cares if it's 2020? 2020 is just a number. It's just Jesus was born 2020 years ago. That's The world isn't 2020 years old. Society and cultures are much older than 2000 years, right? So this idea when we say we've got to change it, it's 2020, doesn't really convince or persuade me personally. Because 2020 means different things to different countries. And the number 2020 doesn't explain the whole history. It's just an arbitrary number from which Jesus was born. Um, so I think that paragraph is really important for this East-West. With this tiny bit of historical and comparative perspective, it is easier to see why it is unreasonable to use the status of multiculturalism in the West today as a basis for declaring the failure of multiculturalism in South Korea, both now and in the future. So while concrete political and social change remains limited in South Korea, there are signs that a multicultural society is emerging. One of the most prominent signs of this was the 2012 appointment of Jasmine Lee, uh, Bakurene Neville, to South Korean's National Assembly. Lee was born and raised in the Philippines, married a Korean national and became a naturalized Korean citizen. Uh, that was under the Im Yong Bak government. I believe now she went to Dobolo Minju, she swapped sides. With a single, while a single case is hardly definitive, Lee's appointment symbolized and reinforced a sea change in South Korea. The redefining of Korean identity from one based largely on blood, du sanguinis, to one that is now open to those without even a single drop of Korean blood. Thus, while it was true that Lee quickly became the target of racist vitriol, it is fair to say that only a few decades earlier, her appointment to the National Assembly would have been almost literally unimaginable. In this regard, South Korea has experienced a profound discursive or cultural shift with respect to the conception of national identity. And while it is easy to dismiss the significance of such a shift, consider this. If people, i.e. state leaders and members of the dom dominant ethne, unswervingly and unthinkingly believe in the absolute sanctity of racial and ethnic purity, there can be no prospect of including those without shared blood as full or partial members of the same society. Multiculturalism, in short, is only possible once an alternative understanding of national identity is accepted, even if that acceptance is incomplete and subject to dispute. From this perspective, one can argue that South Korea is on the road to multiculturalism, 
although the journey has only just begun. So this article, I, I think, kind of deals quite nicely with the East and West Georgetown Journal of International Affairs, Timothy Lim, October 2017. Do you agree or disagree? Is I, I think most of us, we can and should agree that the, the East and West comparisons are a little bit dangerous there. You know, we, sh we shouldn't compare because of the journeys. But how about Timothy Lim's conclusion that now South Korea no longer defines Koreanness by blood. Koreanness is about law. It's about citizenship. And that's what defines it. And it might be slow, but it will get there in the end. Uh, I'll leave this here because we're going long on time. Um, please put a comment on the website today. As, uh, uh, by the end of this week, please put a comment on the website as part of your assignment. I'm trying not to give you too too much work all the time because some students have said there's too much work online and it's hard to manage. OK, so I respect that and giving you opportunities to, to discuss. Um, but with this one, please put a comment and I'll check your attendance or your score for that. Also start considering your final exam, your, your final report, what, what you want to write about and research, look at the topics. Finally, last thing I will say is that uh, this week with Gogo Tewa, I'm doing live Zoom kangi. I, I'm doing live Zoom classes, specifically Tuki Gogo Tewa, because we need live conversation. If, if, manyage, if it goes well, I might try it in classes like this. I'm not sure. I haven't decided. But this is week 12, so maybe 13 or 14. I might try it. But it depends because Gogub Dewa has fewer students. We're just sort of doing We're dividing it like that so it's a bit easier. With our big course, it's a bit more difficult. I'm not sure. If you have any opinions or comments about that, let me know and help me make my decision because I'm still thinking about it. If you have any questions or comments, get in touch. Send me a message. Send me an email. Uh, send, me a me send me a Zoom. You know what? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good